Can you hear me at the back? Um, thank you, Will, and uh, congratulations to you and your team on a fantastic day. This has really been something. And thank you to all of you who are here. When I saw that I was going to be last, I thought, God, everybody's going to run out of steam by the time I get to me. But uh, so it's nice to see you out of the audience. Um, as it says, I'm a professor in the music department. Um, often when I tell people that I'm, uh, I'm in music at, at Case Western Reserve, they say, oh, so you're at CIM. And I say, well, no, actually, I'm in the Department of Music at CWRU, which is housed in Hayden Hall or Hyatt Hall. Um, my colleagues include um, people like Kathleen Horvath, music education and uh, ensemble direction, and a lot of musicologists. So what I'm going to be talking about today is musicology, because that's what, uh, that's what I do. Another thing that people ask me is, oh, so you're in music, um, what's your instrument? And not all musicologists have instruments, it happens that I have a performance, um, a performance aspect, which is that I'm the uh, artistic director of Choir Cleveland. But um, musicology is what we're talking about today. So what is a musicologist? Well, the interesting thing you should ask, and in fact, um, to answer that question, I'm going to go to breakfast. Um, there's a famous story that the composer Dmitry Shostakovich was having a friend over for breakfast, and the friend said, what exactly is a musicologist? And Shostakovich answered, well, you see, my friend, we are here eating these eggs, and my chef, Pasha, has prepared the eggs so wonderfully. Now, imagine a person who does not cook the eggs, does not eat the eggs, but only talks about the eggs. That is a musicologist. <laughs> So, I love musicology. I love the sleuthing aspect, doing historical research to find out something, um, something uh, related to music, and sometimes the other arts as well. This is a book that I wrote um, several years ago that's actually sold tens of thousands of copies around the world on historical tuning systems. Another one that I wrote is Shakespeare's Songbook, which uncovered a whole web of allusions and quotations of popular song in the plays of Shakespeare, things that people hadn't really realized. And it's, um, it's that work that I'm going to talk about first of all. There are two projects, two short projects that I did over the last year that attract a lot of attention in the popular press. And so I'm going to talk about them and talk my way through the process that I used to do this kind of uh, research. So the first thing is a passage from Love's Labor's Lost by Shakespeare. Beginning of Act 3, and you can see the braggart, Don Adriano de Armado, appears and he says, warble child, make passionate my sense of hearing, and the boy, who is his servant, Moth, responds, con colonel. Well, when I wrote my book on songs in Shakespeare, I didn't talk about that, because I had no idea what it meant. People have developed ideas about, well, con colonel doesn't really mean anything. Uh, maybe it's Italian, maybe, maybe it's Gaelic, maybe it's, maybe it's French. And so I turned my attention to this about a year ago, and thought, well, what is the most obvious possible thing that could happen that might turn it into something that actually exists? And I thought, well, one of those things might be that instead of con colonel, in fact, maybe that last letter is meant to be a T instead of an L, and it's con colonel. So um, we have con colonel also from the, the uh, first folio of Shakespeare. So we have two sources for this, and they both say con colonel. Obviously, the people who edited the first folio of Shakespeare, they didn't know what it was either. They just reproduced it. So, using Con Coligné, I actually found an early 17th century, 62, poem in a French collection that said Con Coligné. And, um, in fact, um, you can see that in this uh, quarto of Shakespeare's Henry V, that that substitution of T and L takes place here. That word should actually be parle, speak. And in fact, it's part instead. So that's just exactly the reverse of what I'm suggesting happened in this case. So con is the is the uh, chanson as it's described, and con is used at the beginning of several stanzas. So it's easy to see why that might stand for a certain song um, in the play. Interesting that um, a couple of the lines say Isabelle Isabelle Jacquette and his 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 uh, pretty jacket. Well, the fact is that in the play, Love's Labor's Lost, Don Adriano's love, beloved is a young woman named Jacquette. So, Isabella Jacquette, Isabella Jacquette, it seemed like that was a real, 
um, obvious connection and reinforce the idea that this was the song that was, um, that was being cited. There are some other oddities about it, though. Here's this line, lui disant que son membre est trop bon et petit, telling him his penis is too soft and too small. <laughs> so what's going on is that Moth is making fun of Don Adriano, who is, he's described as a braggart. Uh, he's blustering, he's completely oblivious to what's going on. And so in singing this song, or part of this song, uh, Moth was making fun of his, um, of his master. But, so we've got a song, but we don't have any melody for it. And you can see um, that the, uh, the line lengths are all different. There's an odd number of lines. So what on earth could the song have used? Could this lyric have used for a melody? One thing you'll notice about it is that there is a refrain um, after the first verse, and then you can see it occurs after all the other verses as well. Um, and I put that together with the fact that um, the only thing that's said about the, the tune is this, will you win your love with a French brawl? How meanest thou brawling in French? So, uh, Don Adriano has no idea what French brawl is. A French brawl is a kind of, a kind of dance. Um, and so it implied that maybe this tune, um, the tune that set on Polyne, was a French brawl, a kind of dance. So, then I discovered that the refrain from that song appears in this play, La Combe de Chanson from just a couple of decades after the song appeared. Um, it doesn't say what the tune is there either, but very soon after that, the next scene begins with Essemars, which is the name of a French song from the period. The tune Essemars in England was identified with a tune uh, known as Selinger's Brown. And in spite of the complication of the lyric, I discovered that the lyric fit perfectly to Selinger's Brown. So now I'm going to sing it for you, and, and any of you that can read French and uh, read music notation are welcome to sing along. Mon coliné faisait la boum avec sa poupe de Mon coliné faisait la boum avec sa poupe de Et sa belle jaquette qui l'a fait, qui l'a dit, coliné mon ami, Belle jaquette, vrai Dieu qu'il est joli. Hélas, Guillaume, monsieur le, monsieur le, monsieur le, Jean, hélas, Guillaume, qui l'a battu. So that was um, my reconstruction of what that song would have been. I think it's pretty clear that this was the lyric, and maybe this was the tune as well. It certainly works. So this was my article about it. Conconinel, Moth's Lost Song Recovered, and this is what the popular press did to it. Shakespeare's secret song revealed cryptic word Conconinel and play identified as title of X-rated French kitty. So you just never know. <laughs> What's going to happen to your work once it gets out? <laughs> okay. The other short um, research project that I'm sharing with you has to do with music and art. I, 25 years ago, I published a catalog of musical subjects in Western art at the Art Museum, and so they were preparing this exhibit called Themes and Variations, and they asked me to look at the list of things they were doing and to look at their captions to make sure that they were describing the instruments correctly. So this was one of the items in this um, several pages of, uh, of, uh, of things they sent me. And this was the caption, and it says, in Greek mythology, Orpheus was a singer and poet. He was given a lyre by Apollo. And what I noticed is that the instrument that's depicted is not actually a lyre. I mean, we think of a lyre as being a harp-like instrument from Greek antiquity. But in Italy, in the Renaissance, they had the word lyra that was also used for a bowed string instrument called the lyra da braccio, the lyra of the arm. And that's what this was. If you look at this surviving lyra, it's very highly decorated. It survives in a, at a museum in Vienna. You can see that the, the, the peg box at the top is a very distinctive shape, like a spade or, or a shovel or a, or a leaf or something like that. And that contrasts with the standard violin family. This is the 16th century viola, and you can see the peg box, um, as you might recognize it from modern instruments as well, and how different it is from the uh, peg box on the lyra del braccio. So there was the instrument in the engraving, and it was clearly a lira de braccio. And when I wrote back to Heather Lamonides, the, uh, the curator at the art museum, to tell her about this, I said, you know, an interesting thing about the lira de braccio is that Leonardo da Vinci, the famous artist, was renowned as a lira de braccio player. We don't know anything about it, about what he did, but we know that he was a, he was a player. 
Then I went to see the exhibit for the first time. And for the first time, I looked at the player instead of just the instrument. I've been concentrating on the instrument because that's what I was asked to do. I looked at the player and I thought, that is really strange. Here's this guy in old middle age, advanced middle age, playing this instrument. He's supposed to be Orpheus. And this is not what Orpheus looks like. There are dozens and dozens of images of Orpheus throughout the rest of the Renaissance. And he doesn't look like this. He's a, a youthful man, the young husband of Eurydice. And he's shown playing Larry Braccio, sometimes a, a, a harp or something as well, but, but very often uh, a bowed string instrument, unshaven and a young man. So what was different? Well, I thought maybe actually this is a depiction of Leonardo da Vinci playing the Larry Braccio. But we don't have that many images of Leonardo da Vinci. There's this famous one. Well, first of all, this is, a, this is how we know that Leonardo was a, uh, was a Lira de Bracci player. And you can see the text. Leonardo was lending great repute to the Duke of Milan, who took much delight in the sound of the Lyra so that he might play it. And Leonardo brought with him that instrument, which he had made in his own hands, in great part of silver, in order that the harmony might be of greater volume and more sonorous in tone, with which he surpassed all the musicians who had come together there to play. Besides this, he was the best improviser in verse of his day, Hearing him to do so admired Leonardo, was so enamored of his virtues that it was incredible. So this is our testimonial to the, the, the skill of Leonardo on the Lira de Braccio and his, his, um, his excellence as a musician. So, but is this Leonardo? Does it look like it? Well, there are very few portraits of Leonardo. There's this famous one, portrait of an old man um, in, in 1512. Leonardo was 60 when he drew this portrait. This does not look like a 60-year-old man to me. He looks much older. So I, I'm, I'm not convinced that this really is a portrait, a self-portrait of Leonardo. But there is one that comes close, one of the um, only portraits of Leonardo during his lifetime, by his assistant, Francesco Melzi, in 1506. So just about exactly the same time as, um, as the Marcantonio print of Orpheus, um, and you can see that the centrally parted hair, the long curls, the slight bump in the nose, the little ridge on the eyebrow, oh, over the brow, um, this really looks like Leonardo. These depictions are from just about exactly the same time, and there's a real resentment between them. So this was my article that appeared in uh, the um, Members Magazine at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and it got picked up. Um, by a lot of other um, popular press venues as well. Here it is in Live Science. Who knew that Leonardo and music was, uh, was science? But there you go. Um, da Vinci discovered art sleuthing reveals Leonardo engraving. NBC News. There were there were news outlets all over the world that uh, picked it up. And then Huffington Post, which was an interesting one to me because they actually asked two. Leonardo experts from New York, what they thought of my discovery. And one of them said, well, it's, the artwork is not by Leonardo himself, so it really is not very interesting anyway. And the other one said, well, maybe it's not Leonardo. Maybe it's just Orpheus, and it's not really Leonardo. But I ask you, we know Leonardo played the Lira de Braccio. We know that there was a production of Orfeo in Milan at the home of, our, uh, of Leonardo's patron, Charles d'Amboise, in 1506 or 7, sometime around then. And we've got this depiction of Leonardo in 50, around 1506. It just has to be the same, has to be the same person in my opinion. So I think I nailed it. But maybe if you don't make the discovery yourself, you just don't believe it. Anyway, that's it. That's showing how fun it is to do historical research in the arts. Thank you.